Welcome back, everybody. Your boy Nathro is back on the scene. Yes, believe it or not, I am back with some oversimplified. The Russian Revolution. I know it's been out for a while, and um, it's been a little tough to get to things outside of making these videos. Uh, I do have a full time job, so. Sometimes it can be pretty challenging to find time for all this, but what keeps me going and motivated is all of you guys, so thanks. I know the Russian Revolution happened during World War I, but there was a lot of things that occurred um, before it actually happened in the early 1900s, and there's a lot that led up to it, so I am pretty excited as to what Oversimplify is going to do. It's a pretty long video, 21 minutes, so let's get started. This video was made possible by NordVPN. Click on the link in the description below to get an amazing 68% off a two-year plan. Also, commemorating the weirdest bromance in history. Get Playing your cards? new character pins <laughs> and Russian Revolution merch available now. Cool. Link down below. Hey Jimmy, it's the 1800s, an exciting time to be alive. Why don't you get out there and explore the world? Gee whiz, Mom, thanks. This place is amazing. Where am I? Why, you're in France, my boy. Here we come up with <laughs> wacky new ways of running a country. Liberty, egality, fraternity. Whoa, All welcome right. to the United Kingdom. Here we invented the train. Oh, aboard. <laughs> Holy smokes. You're in a German factory, my friend. Here we harness fire and coal to create all these sexy lederhosen. This is incredible. I can't all wait right. to see where I'll end up <laughs> next. Uh-oh. Where am I? <laughs> You're in Russia. Have I gone back in time? <laughs> no, this is just how it is. Are mm. you a farmer? Worse. Technically, my landlord owns me, which makes me a serf. I'm scared. You should be, <laughs> because I haven't eaten in four days, and you look pretty tasty. Oh, oh. Hey, Jimmy, how are your travels? <laughs> I hate you! So I'm assuming serf is just another way of saying that they were a slave. Um, yeah, I can imagine that being pretty tough. You know, all your all your neighbors are progressing pretty far, and your country seems to be kind of, like they said, stuck in time. That's definitely going to fuel resentment, so, yeah, here we go. Russia in the 19th century. Feudal, underdeveloped, and stuck in the past, while the rest of Europe <laughs> have been modernizing. Oh, was that Life of Boris? I think that was Life of Boris. Ah, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Let's keep going. Improving their citizens' lives. Russia's rulers were taking a different approach. My lord, we're falling behind the rest of Europe. It's time to industrialize, give the people rights, and share your power. Russian czars had no time for <laughs> pathetic ideas like liberty and modernization because they were too busy having the time of their lives. While the serfs were breaking their backs in the fields, the czars held all the power, and they didn't have to listen to anyone. Want to run the country like a backwards feudal kingdom while the rest of Europe outpaces you militarily and economically? Mm. Go right ahead. Want to keep the people uneducated so they don't get any ideas? There's no one to stop you. Want to keep exporting grain even when there's a massive famine causing hundreds of thousands to die? That is your God-given wow. right. While all of this was <laughs> great for the Tsar, if you were literally anybody else, it probably sucked because Russia was falling behind. If they were to keep up with Europe, they'd need a strong ruler with some big ideas. Oh look, here comes one now. Hey everyone, it's me, Tsar Alexander II, and I've got some big news. I'm releasing you all from your serfdom. You're all free. Hey, nice. Yep, I'm the best. Oh, there is one thing though. I spoke to your local lords and they weren't happy about losing all their free labor. So as a compromise, you're all gonna have to pay them back a near impossible amount of money for the next 49 years. Expect your lives to barely change. Okay, bye. <laughs> now I know it. Okay. So, to me, that looked like more of a publicity stunt. So, when you know your people are doing very poorly and there's a lot of civil unrest, you try to, I guess, think of a way to make them happy, even though you know nothing's really going to change. So, it's like, it's like a diversionary tactic, you know, like it. It gets people thinking, it gets people talking about how, well, hey, there was a change, even though we're poor, but hey, um, at least this guy did something, you know, but if a lot didn't change, then that's only going to last for so long. Anyway. You're thinking, this Tsar Alexander II seems like a pretty cool guy. He's trying to reform the country <laughs> and get Russia on the right path. Everyone must love this guy, right? Wrong. 
Why does one man get to decide the fate of everyone in the country? This whole system is dumb. Somebody should do something. Like what? Like kill the czar. You're gonna kill the czar? Well, me, no. I'm busy. Shh. I was kind of hoping you'd do it. Okay. See? The people <laughs> love me. They're throwing flowers, confetti, and high-grade explosives. Okay, Nicholas. Your grandfather has a mild oh case of being blown up by a terrorist, and he's not looking <laughs> too hot. So we're gonna go say our goodbyes, okay? No, it'll be too scary for him. Nonsense. It won't be scary at all. We're just gonna say a quick goodbye. Ready? Boy. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Look at me. The people did this to me. And one day, they'll do it to you! See? Wasn't scary at all. He's all traumatized. The second was dead. But luckily, they had another Alexander lying around. Alexander the third, And he felt his dad's reforms had weakened the Tsar's authority. Russia was massive, and as a result, had many ethnic Still minorities. Non-Russians? More interested in their own cultural heritage than in loving me? Isn't it great? So much beautiful culture and diversity in our great nation. Mm. Alexander thought all these minorities should be a little more Russian, and thereby loyal to him. So he oh, repressed boy. religious minorities. Okay. He repressed non-Russians. He introduced the Okhrana, a secret police force that repressed anybody who thought having a czar was dumb. If Alexander II was the great reformer, Alexander III was the great repressor. Now that's how you run a country. Whoa, okay. So to him, by Russifying, <laughs> I guess, the people, you know, that'll create, I guess, more unity and less chance of upheaval. Also, during that time, uh, neighboring countries, Germany in particular, was getting pretty strong. And he thought, well, if Germany's getting strong and I'm having all these, like, uprisings happening and maybe, you know, a large group of minority people want to gain independence or something, you know, maybe they'll they'll back up Germany with an invasion of Russia or something like that. So that was just another element that added to like this whole, hey, let's make Russia more Russian. Anyway, yeah, let's keep going. Hey, Dad. Ugh, great. It's my son, Nicholas, who I like to call a girly girl because he's so weak and pathetic. When are you going to grow up? <laughs> <laughs> Eh, oh, that was you fast. You still like a girly girl to me. But Dad, <laughs> I grew a beard. Yeah, an ugly girly girl beard. <laughs> if Nicholas was to one day be czar, he needed his dad to teach him how to run the country. But his dad instead suggested that Nicholas go somewhere else. So Nicholas went to Japan, got an edgy dragon tattoo, had his head sliced off by a policeman, and then came home. Now will you teach me how to rule? <sighs> I suppose it's time. Okay, there's a lot you need to know before becoming czar. Uh-oh. What? I've got kidney inflammation. Oh, no. <laughs> Upon his father's death, a totally unprepared Nicholas II ascended to the Russian throne. Okay, well, when something like that happens, that just makes things even worse because people don't want an inexperienced dictator either. Maybe some people will say, hey, maybe there will finally be some change. But if people will have no faith in you as a leader, you know, like, man, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Like, let's put somebody else in charge. They can see that as an opportunity as well. Like, hey, maybe this can be the time where, like, different political parties can seize power. Ugh. This is just, like, <laughs> one bad thing happening after another in Russia. He wasn't a reformer like his grandfather, nor was he a repressor like his dad. Nicholas was Nicholas. Timid, easily swayed, and more interested in doing whatever the hell this is. Or this. Or this. He wasn't ready to rule, and he himself admitted it, saying, I'm not yet ready to be czar. I know nothing of the business of ruling. Not good. <laughs> Bit of an awkward time to bring it up. However, Nicholas firmly believed that yeah. he was chosen by God to be Russia's big daddy. And while he doubted his ability to rule, he was going to give it his best shot. And hey, who knows? Maybe he wouldn't be so bad after all. To get things off to a good start, Nicholas promised free pretzels and beer to a huge hey. crowd in Moscow. Whoa. I found Waldo. Look at the screen. Towards the left, you see him? I found him. We found him now. Let's <laughs> go to celebrate his coronation. So enticing a proposition to starving peasants that the ensuing stampede left nearly 1,500 people dead. What the hell happened? Ooh. We're not sure, but you're scheduled to go party with the French at 8 o'clock. Shouldn't I stay here out of respect for the people? When have Russian czars ever respected the people? Hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nicholas's decision to go party with the French immediately tarnished his image. Some were calling him Nicholas the Bloody. Gee, I wonder the why. The had been partying hard at the expense of the people for long enough. They'd emancipated oh. the serfs, but failed to lift them out of poverty. They used their secret police to crack down on anyone who might criticize them. And they'd failed to modernize and give the people rights, something the rest of Europe had begun doing over a century mm. ago. The rule of the czars was quickly becoming outdated, and more and more Russians began wondering if there was a better way. For many, the solution was simple. Just look to the West. Republics, democracies, and constitutional monarchies galore. But a small growing group rejected that for an even better idea. A little something they called mm. communism. I thought so. Okay. That is a very big reason as to why the popularity of communism, you know, began to rise significantly. The main selling point of communism was that everybody was going to be treated equally. You know, there's not going to be a humongous gap between the rich and the poor. Everyone's going to be well off, you know, to a certain point. And at that time, you know, maybe you're not necessarily rich, but it probably sounds a heck of a lot better than <laughs> than being poor. So it's like, shoot, well, like, I'll take being, I guess, like middle class any day. <laughs> yeah. Take Vladimir Lenin, an intelligent member of Russia's middle class, and also a massive ill-tempered jerk. If you disagreed with him about anything, he wasn't afraid to call you out. You fat-headed, simple-minded, vapid, cockeyed imbecile! Tender heart bear is a far superior care bear to bedtime bear. <laughs> what? And he was okay. no stranger That's to political unrest either. His older brother was executed for plotting to kill the czar, and Lenin himself was expelled from university for participating in a student protest. But how did Lenin go from being a middle class nerd to the arbiter of socialist divinity? Well, to tell that story, we first need to go back a few decades to when a man named Karl Marx wrote a manifesto explaining how capitalism is a system whereby the stinky bourgeoisie oppressed and exploited the working masses and that only through class warfare could the workers rise up and instate a communist utopia. Now go back forward a few decades to Lenin reading that manifesto and loving it. But publicly admitting you loved Marx and not Russia's big daddy would get you the cruelest punishment uh -oh. imaginable. Exile to Siberia. Enjoy exile where you'll live with your wife, chill around town, and secretly write socialist newspapers. Hey, that doesn't sound so bad. I was gonna say and the your mother-in-law is going to live with you. No! Ah, Once stupid. Lenin finished his stint in Siberia, he left Russia for Europe, where he was free to hang out with other Russian Marxists and talk about how great communism was. Now today, you might hear the word communism and think of this. <laughs> but that's not how intellectuals oh, living gosh. under a tough czarist regime saw it. To them, communism promised a land where all were equal, where workers yep. weren't exploited, and even there you people go. like you could get a girlfriend. So Lenin joined a party of Russian <laughs> okay. communists living in Europe, and he founded a communist newsletter that was smuggled into Russia to try go. to radicalize the people. Mm. However, not everyone in the Socialist Party agreed with Lenin. In fact, they disagreed with him on a lot of issues, and Lenin was so uncompromising that he caused a split in the party. During one conference, a heated debate broke out, and Lenin was unwilling to give an inch. You pig ignorant, half-witted, fatuous morons! Cereal is a soup! Listen, Lenin, you're a smart guy, but you have no idea what you're talking about. We're out of here. All in favor of cereal being a soup? Hey, would you look at that? We're in the majority. So Lenin set up his own faction within the party he called the majority, or Bolshevik if you're speaking Russian. And the other faction became known as the minority, or Menshevik. And oddly, the majority were often in the minority, and the minority in the majority. The Mensheviks were less radical. What? <laughs> what? That's an interesting play on words. I guess that was their way of seeming like they were a bigger party than they actually were to get more people on their side. Does that about sum it up? <laughs> yeah, let me know about that in the comments, please. Cool. Whereas Lenin wanted the Bolsheviks to be loyal to him and his uncompromising ideas. And if you weren't loyal, well then you're gonna get a big brain beatdown. Mensheviks worried that Lenin's attitude could lead to a one-man dictatorship. But come on, does this guy look like a dictator to you? For now, Lenin remained in Europe, writing his socialist newspaper and impatiently awaiting an opportunity to overthrow the Tsar and bring communist utopia to Russia. Cool. A free hat. Who the heck are you? I'm definitely not a Russian secret police officer spying on Marxists. Oh crap, <laughs> I don't want secret police watching me. Then you, my friend, should use NordVPN. Uh, Do you like having your identity stolen? If yes, you need therapy. Nice if transition. No, you need NordVPN. NordVPN has thousands of super fast servers in 62 countries that you can connect to to keep you and your data secure when using the web. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and is now faster and more secure than ever with its brand new NordLynx technology. 
Have you quarantine binged all of your favorite shows on Netflix? Well, with NordVPN, you can watch the Australian version. Or is one of the greatest videos on YouTube still banned in your country? I think you get the point. You can now get NordVPN with 68% off a two-year plan for only $3.71 per month, plus one month free. So click on nordvpn.com slash oversimplified in the description below and get protected now. That's Very nordvpn.com nice. slash oversimplified. And as always, you'll be supporting my channel. So muchos arigatos, mon petit pois. Now where was I? Oh yeah, a timid, easily swayed czar a massive ill-tempered jerk, <laughs> impatiently awaiting a communist revolution. Uh-oh. And revolution was coming, but not in the way Lenin thought. Back in St. Petersburg, one of the Tsar's most skilled and influential advisors knew the country finally needed to catch up with the rest of Europe. Hey, Nick, we really got to industrialize, get more factories, and make some, I don't know, textiles or something. Hmm, won't that change the social fabric of Russia? Maybe. Hey, isn't it past your bedtime? But I haven't had my milk and snuggles yet. Will wow. you snuggle me? Um, <laughs> Nicholas thought modernization Whatever was boring, it takes. <laughs> but he let Sergei do his thing. And do his thing he did. He borrowed some money and got Russia some sexy factories. And you know what sexy factories means. Sexy workers. Dirt poor sexy <laughs> oh, workers. No. Long hours, low wages, filthy disease-ridden mm. factories. Sleep in overcrowded dormitories with all your stinky worker friends. Get your arms ripped off in a freak Russian doll accident. Conditions were terrible. But this growing working class wasn't about to take it lying down. They started to do what workers do best, strike. Despite Sergei's efforts, so people begins. in Russia still weren't happy. Peasants were still poor, liberals still wanted reform, and now the workers wanted better working conditions. Okay, yes, this is where things started to really take a turn. When most of your population is very poor, I mean, people don't really have anything to lose. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, sure, if I, you know, strike or rebel or something, okay, um, I'll get punished, I'll get shot, I'll whatever. But life for them was so tough and they were so poor and they were pretty much like starving and like life was like a living hell basically. So it's like something's got to give. Like we don't, we'll, we'll try something. What do we have to lose? We may as well do something or try to do something about it and see where it goes. You know what I mean? It's like, it's either try something or just keep living in misery. So, yeah. And the problem with being an autocrat is that when everyone's unhappy, there's only one person to blame. You. The people hate me. Mm. What do I do? Ooh, I know. Why don't we find a weak and pathetic nation to go to war with? We'll win easily and everyone will love me again. Why don't we just try treating the people better? <laughs> As luck would have it, an opportunity for war was forming in the oh, Far East. Oh, it's Japan. Russia wanted to expand its sphere of influence into northern China. And coincidentally, so did Japan. But Japan didn't really want war, so they proposed an idea to reduce the tension. Hey man, we'll let you do your thing in Manchuria if you let us do our thing in Korea. Uh, I don't think so. We've got the largest army in the world. What do you have? I'm the emperor of Japan. I have a giant mecha suit. Whoa. <laughs> cool. Nicholas and the boys didn't see Japan as a threat, so they felt they could push Big Japan mistake. around. But little did they know Japan had been rapidly militarizing, and when they launched a surprise attack on a Russian fleet at Port Arthur, everyone was shocked. Nicholas yeah. hoped it was an opportunity to win a quick war and regain the support of the people. Nobody seriously thought a puny Asian country could defeat a European superpower, and the Russian people were filled <laughs> with patriotic thick. spunk. Hey everyone, we're at war with Japan! Hey everyone? We're losing the war. Uh, yeah. The Japanese won. An embarrassing defeat for Tsar Nicholas. Russia had enough problems, but now it had been internationally humiliated. Okay, so that is actually another very popular tactic when an empire is struggling. It's pretty much another attempt at distracting the people. It's like, hey, things aren't bad at all. Look, we're, we defeated a, a tyrannical nation that was threatening us you know so it, it looks good on paper it looks like your country is strong and yeah it's just a tactic to try and you know lift the, the people's spirits up but in this case it backfired and they actually lost to japan which just is another thing added onto the fire let's keep going the public were outraged. Unrest increased. Nicholas needed snuggles now more than ever. The tension was rising rapidly, and Russia was on the verge of revolution. 
All it needed was one disaster to push it over the edge. And that disaster would come in January 1905 from an unlikely source, a handsome Orthodox priest named Father Gapon. Father Gapon was leading workers and their families to the Winter Palace, but this wasn't some violent uprising. It was a peaceful protest. They wanted to deliver a petition to Nicholas, which simply asked for more freedom and better working conditions. The protest was actually so peaceful and respectful that the Marxists thought it was a big waste of time. Hey Nicholas, some priest is leading a peaceful protest. Says here they want to give you a petition. A peaceful petitioning priest? I better get out of here. Nicholas had actually left the Winter Palace days earlier, and in his place, they brought in a truckload of troops, ordered to stop Father mm. Gapon from reaching the palace. Hello, good sir, and long live the Tsar. Please, allow me to pass this simple petition to our dear father, Nicholas II. Good day to you too. Please, allow us to respond by opening fire. Ooh. <laughs> Not good. What began as a peaceful protest ended in tragedy. Imperial soldiers opened fire on the crowd. Around 200 civilians died. 800 more were wounded. All they wanted wow. was the opportunity to ask Nicholas to improve their lives. Instead, they were met with bullets. Nicholas didn't personally order the troops to fire, but as an autocrat, he got the blame. The event became known as Bloody Sunday, and Nicholas's mm. reputation plummeted. Strikes erupted across the empire. Workers' demands increased. Liberals demanded political power. Peasants demanded land. The country was out of control, and the 1905 revolution had begun. Listen, Nicholas, peasants seizing my land and murdering my family I can tolerate, but illegally chopping my wood? That's obscene! And the worse I treat my workers, the more they strike. I don't get it. Everyone relax. As long as the military is still on my side, there's nothing to worry about. Sir, the sailors are starting to mutiny. Well, my Ooh. life just sucks. With Russia still losing to the Japanese, unrest was growing in the military. Okay, wow. When your military starts turning against you, that's when your days are pretty much numbered. That's like the one thing that a country needs in order to like keep itself in check. You know, it's like, okay, my country's going through a rough time, but as long as I have the, the loyalty of my military, I can still kind of, you know, keep the peace, whether it be by force or, you know, uh, some other way. But once the military starts turning on you, that's when things are really bad. And then they mention that they're still losing the war to Japan. So at the time, Japan beating Russia was a huge deal. It changed the dynamic of how the world saw both the Western powers and like the Asian powers. Cause like for a long time, um, the Western powers like um, Europe and the United States, you know, they were seen as like very powerful, unrivaled nations. Like they were colonizing all these areas. But finally we have a power that's emerging uh, in the east in Japan and now that kind of threw into question well you know maybe there's going to be a, a dominant power in Asia that's not of western influence so that increased Japan's confidence greatly and then that confidence got even more reinforced during World War One, and then that led into what happened in World War Two, and yeah but anyway that I digress <laughs> Let's keep on going. And some sailors had even taken to killing officers. Having the people against you was bad enough, but if the military joined in, it would be game over. To make matters worse, yeah. in October, <laughs> Big workers time. and Marxists, including one Leon Trotsky, began setting up local elected councils called Soviets that coordinated strikes and supplied the workers. Sergei could see the writing on the wall. Things were going south fast, and he needed a big idea to save the Tsar. And luckily, he had just that. You see, all these angry people from different parts of society weren't really working together, meaning there was a weakness to exploit. Sergei wrote a manifesto that would give the liberals an elected assembly called the Duma. It took some convincing, but eventually, Nicholas agreed to share power and have his laws approved by an elected assembly. Hey liberals, here's your stupid manifesto. Happy now? We certainly are. But what about these guys? Aren't you gonna give them what they want? Oh, goodness no. I was just gonna kill them. With the liberals satisfied, <laughs> oh and after God. ending the war with Japan, the Tsar brought thousands of troops home, who then dismantled the Soviets, arrested their leaders, and crushed the peasant uprisings in the countryside. And how Damn. about that pesky parliament Nicholas had agreed to share power with? Well, he then wrote a bunch of new laws, which basically said, hey, remember that manifesto I wrote and how you guys were gonna approve my laws? Mm-hmm, slight change of plan. Actually, I'm gonna do whatever the hell I want, and you guys are gonna shut up. What? The people won't stand for this. Ah. <sighs> At that point, you're pretty much going back on your word, which is definitely something you don't want to do when your empire is hanging on by a thread. 
you know, like your military is already turning on you, the people already hate you, and the, I guess, promise that you made, and then like you're even turning your back on that. <laughs> Not good. People. What people? Ooh. You know, this is why people don't like it. And <laughs> oh just like God. that, yeah. Nicholas had survived the 1905 revolution. But wait, Jeez. a revolution? In Russia? Where was Lenin? Well, Lenin and his communist pals were still in exile. He tried cool. desperately to radicalize the uprising, but all he could do was watch. As the movements failed to organize, the liberals sold out the poor, and the Tsarat played the people. Furious, mm. he believed Russia had missed a great chance for a real revolution. From now on, he felt the only way left was an armed revolution by the workers. Watching the events of 1905 unfold, Lenin learned a lot. The Tsar, however, would prove to have learned nothing. After the 1905 revolution had failed, the Tsar's new top man was Pyotr Stolopin, and he had big ideas to prevent any more chaos. Step one, reform agriculture. This will make the peasants love you. And step two, we'll kill anyone who doesn't. To discourage any wow. revolutionary ideas, Stolopin <laughs> began to crack down even harder on the Tsar's opponents, and thousands were sentenced to death. The noose even earned itself a new nickname, Stolopin's necktie. I don't get it. Oh, I see, because it goes around my neck. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh man, see, another display of threatening power. So, it's amazing how long he kind of escaped what he had coming to him. If World War I hadn't have happened, who knows where Russia would be today, right? But despite the oppression, many positive reforms were also being made, and the Russian economy even began to improve. This was a problem for Lenin. If the people weren't suffering, then they wouldn't support a revolution. Still in exile and lacking funds, the Bolsheviks simply weren't in a position to do anything. Luckily, it was around this time that Lenin met an incredibly handsome Georgian with your second favorite historical mustache, Joseph Stalin. Ooh. Lenin and Stalin met at a communist convention in Finland, and Lenin liked Enter Stalin, Stalin because he was a real go-getter and was great at fundraising for the Bolsheviks. And by fundraising, I mean kidnapping, robbing, extorting, bribing, ransoming, assassinating, prison breaking, oh, stealing, damn. bank raiding, executioning, and stealing again. Hey Stalin, the Mensheviks aren't so hot in all this stealing, but we still need money, so the next time you do a big heist, just do it quietly. Okay. Quiet. <laughs> sure. <Got it. laughs> yeah. This isn't quiet. I don't know what is. Stalin's yeah. wacky antics eventually got him yeah. exiled. Stalin to don't give a shit. But he had established himself as a big balls Bolshevik. However, no amount of Bolshevik balls could stop what was happening. The Russian economy was making a recovery. For the Tsar, things were looking up. This is great. All Nicholas has to do is sit back and not mess anything up. Hey everyone. Big news. I'd like to introduce you to my new best friend. He's a crazy, drunken, beardy, horny, scandal-ridden magic wizard man, oh. and he smells like a goat. We're screwed. Rasputin, a dirt poor peasant from dirt poor nowhere. Okay, wow. So I have heard some crazy things about Rasputin. I think the craziest thing that I heard was that when they found his body, like he, I think he had I think he drowned right in a river or something like someone I don't know if maybe someone tied a weight to him like to his feet and threw him in like a river or like maybe a lake or something I can't remember but apparently when they retrieved his body out of the river um, he had apparently been down there for for a long time like I want to say like months or something but when they did like the autopsy they discovered that he had just died maybe like a week or two ago so he somehow kept himself alive for like months before he actually died while submerged underwater i heard something weird like that about rasputin i, I probably got a lot of details messed up but if you know what i'm talking about let me know in the comments i could be super way off base <laughs> with that crazy story and of course it's more than likely not true but hey you never know. Let's keep going. But unlike all the other dirt poor peasants, Rasputin had holy healing powers. <laughs> and when yeah. this holy mystic sure. wandered into St. Petersburg, people began to notice. He quickly became famous, and word of this mystery man in his healing hands made its way to the royal palace. The appearance of a holy homeless healer was of great interest to the Tsar and his wife. As far as royals go, they weren't that inbred, but they were just inbred enough for their son Alexei <laughs> to get hemophilia. Or in layman's terms, Mamma mia, that's a lot of blood. Knowing Rasputin could heal people, in 1906, Alexandra asked for Rasputin to come and see if he could cure their son. And crazy as it sounds, Rasputin did heal Alexei, possibly oh. by taking him off his doctor-prescribed aspirin. 
Having seemingly oh. done the impossible, <laughs> Rasputin became very, Damn. very close to the royal family. But having a crazy homeless wizard man hanging around wasn't a good look for the Tsar, because Rasputin was freaky. Not only was he a big fan I of bet. alcohol, but he'd also throw these crazy parties with Russian nobility, where he'd and all night long, and then he'd his whole head not a guy's and nobody knew how the goat got on the roof. Initially, the press were banned from talking about Rasputin, but eventually, the ban was lifted, and the tabloids went to town. The whole thing was a huge scandal, and everyone was freaked Rasputin's out that this guy was influencing the Tsar and his wife. Nicholas could have spent this period of relative peace improving his image. Instead, he spent it doing this. Oh my but God. as weird as the whole Rasputin thing was, <laughs> so long as the economy continued to improve, and the people's lives uh, kept getting better, maybe Nick would be okay. Maybe there would be no more revolutions. Maybe this video could even end right here. Or maybe things were about to get worse. A lot worse. You see, the year is 1914, and that Ooh. means it's time for World, World War One. War yes! Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Things. Oh, man, it's about to get real. Shit is about to get real. Mm. So, that was the Russian Revolution from Oversimplified part one it was over 20 minutes so i'm gonna do the first one for now and then i'll do the second part a little bit later it was really good i mean it's oversimplified oversimplified always does really good videos very informational as usual and i am very much looking forward to part two very much so that's all the time i have for this episode guys thank you very much for joining me as usual i'll see you next time guys peace out